The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost is lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. A production of LibertyNation.com. Cutting through the double talk, taking on the topics, going after what the politicians really mean, and making it all clear. For your freedom and your liberty. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. The nation takes a deep breath following the triple conviction of Officer Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. But this looks a whole lot more like a beginning than an end. Welcome back into Liberty Nation Radio, a production of LibertyNation.com and heard from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. As leftists of every stripe run to the cameras to proclaim that this guilty verdict is but a small step towards the kind of racial justice they're demanding, we'll look at where the racial justice warriors might strike next and how this verdict will affect the rest of America. And we'll examine how the trial was conducted Conducted and whether the jury was intimidated into their verdict. We'll be joined in the analysis by a crack duo from LibertyNation.com, socio-political correspondent Jeff Charles and legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza. Plus, as George W. Bush breaks his long silence and re-emerges on the public stage, does it set the stage for a true civil war in the Republican Party? Trumpists versus Bushies? Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. We kick things off with our signature segment, Say What?, where we roll out a virtual assembly line of wacky, astonishing, damnable, and ultimately revealing things uttered by politicians and the chattering class. With a nation bracing for impact if Officer Derek Chauvin was acquitted for the killing of George Floyd, came sweet relief for the war-torn cities haunted by the riots of last summer. We, the jury, in the above-entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second-degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Third-degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. Bail is revoked, bond is discharged, and the defendant is remanded to the custody of the Hennepin County Sheriff. So, with Officer Chauvin locked away for many years, we can examine exactly how he was convicted, though the trial itself was by most accounts conducted fairly. The inflammatory comments of grandstanding politicians placed a vice grip of pressure on the jury, including this particularly incendiary one from the infamous Congresswoman Maxine Waters. We're looking for a guilty verdict. If nothing does not happen, then we know of that. We've got to not only stay in the street, but we've got to fight for justice. We've got to get more confrontation. We've got to make sure that they, they know that we need this. Well, Judge Peter Cahill was having none of that, admitting to Chauvin's lawyer that the statement by Maxine Waters could be very damaging. Well, I'll give you that Congresswoman Waters may have given you something on appeal that may result in this whole trial being overturned. I'm aware of the media reports. I'm aware that Congresswoman Waters was talking specifically about this trial and about the unacceptability of uh, anything less than a murder conviction and talk about being confrontational. This goes back to what I've been saying from the beginning. I wish elected officials would stop talking about this case, especially in a manner that is disrespectful to the rule of law and to the judicial branch and our function. I think if they want to give their opinions, they should do so in a respectful and in a manner that is consistent with their oath to the Constitution to respect a co-equal branch of government. Their failure to do so, I think, is abhorrent. Let's hope someone in the political class is listening to the good judge. 
But following the verdict, the politicians could not help themselves piling on the bandwagon and taking virtue signaling to another level, starting with a colleague of Maxine Waters, Democratic Congresswoman Lori Bush, no relation, plus the vice president and president. This verdict is a step. It's a popping of the lock. This was accountability, but it's not yet justice. A measure of justice isn't the same as equal justice. This verdict brings us a step closer. And the fact is, we still have work to do. America has a long history of systemic racism. Black Americans and black men in particular have been treated throughout the course of our history as less than human. Their systemic racism is a stain on our nation's soul. <clears throat> the knee on the neck of justice for black Americans. We have to listen. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. High drama from the 46th president, a stern lecture from the VP, and a call to action by the entire left. We'll discuss more about the trial and the fallout from it a bit later in the show with Jeff Charles and Scott Cosenza. Meanwhile, those looking for clues on the future plans of the 45th president, Donald Trump, may have gotten one in an interview on Fox News where Trump downplayed, when does he ever do that? The issue of Joe Biden's decline and his age, the same age as Trump will be if he runs again in 2024. He's going to be 79 years old. That is not old. I know many people in their late 80s that are just as good as they were years ago. I spoke to one who's 92 years old. He said, I feel better than I did 20 years ago. 78, 79 is not old. Uh, but he, you know, look, uh, I, I don't think it's even appropriate for me to comment on that. It sort of speaks for itself. Well, I guess there's a first time for everything, and that may be. The first time I've ever heard Donald Trump refuse to comment on the troubles of a political opponent, or almost anything for that matter. Finally, there's something to be said for hearing the truth from a source the left can't dismiss, as they do everyone on the right. So as vaccination nation grows by more than two million people every day, we look back and deplore so many of the command and control mechanisms assembled by the left during the pandemic. But when leftist icon Bill Maher says it, it's an entirely different thing, especially when he becomes maybe the first liberal in the country to actually say anything nice about the rising star in the GOP, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Texas lifted its COVID restrictions recently, and their infection rates went down, in part because of people getting outside to let the sun and wind do their thing. <laughs> but to many liberals, that can't be right, because Texas and beach-loving Florida have Republican governors. I've read that the governor of Florida reads. <laughs> Apparently, the governor is also a voracious consumer of the scientific literature. And maybe that's why he protected his most vulnerable population, the elderly, way better than did the governor of New York. Well, you got to give it to Bill Maher when this longtime outspoken liberal social commentator lurches uncontrollably into the truth as he does from time to time. He goes all in. Quick break, and then we're back to discuss a brewing civil war in the Republican Party stoked this week by a former Republican president not named Trump. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com. With one click, you get tomorrow's news today with LNTV's Hot Topics and Analysis. Liberty Nation Radio, the Uprising and Rabbit Hole Podcasts, and dozens of insightful original articles. And now, you can keep your kids ahead of the curve with LNGenZ.com. LNGenZ brings a free-thinking education right into your home for students of every grade level with articles, videos, worksheets, and ready-to-go curriculum. While the media establishment giants are sleeping, you can stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com 
and get tomorrow's news today. LibertyNation.com Where can you find honest political commentary? With sobering analysis, accountability, deconstructing threats to our liberty, and boldly reporting the truth. Subscribe to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel, where facts matter. We believe that all men are entitled to blessings of liberty. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. As the post-2020 Republican Party sorts through the wreckage of a failed election and surpassingly shocking aftermath, it's becoming ever more clear that the GOP is actively dividing into two increasingly distinct and irreconcilable factions. And in breaking his long silence this week, the 43rd president of the United States likely made the battle lines more distinct and the problem worse. It was incredible, really. The beaming co-host of NBC's signature Today Show, Hoda Kotb, welcomed Bush 43 into her little corner of the elite media world as if she was reuniting with a long lost friend. Mr. President, it's so great to see you. It's my pleasure. We have a lot to talk about. I want to talk about the book and these wonderful people. This is the same man, savaged and ridiculed and called an idiot by her industry for eight long years. And yet the former president himself responded as if it was old home week. This after Bush's conspicuous appearance alongside his Democratic predecessor and successor, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, in a widely circulated TV spot urging people to get vaccinated. Why is Bush, who's made a habit of refusing to defend himself or criticize his successors, re-entering the public stage at this time? And why does the same fourth estate which assaulted this president with guns a-blazing now apparently view this former president in a whole different light? Well, the answer comes in a single name, Donald J. Trump. The 43rd president did not mention he who must not be named in the Bush household after the 45th president laid waste to him, his brother, and their neoconservative worldview during the 2016 presidential campaign. But it was hardly necessary. His message was clear, as was his apparent mission to rescue the GOP from the hands of Donald Trump. It's a beautiful country we have, and yet it's not beautiful when we condemn, call people names and scare people about immigration. Yeah. It's an easy issue uh, to, to frighten some of the electorate, and I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to have a different kind of voice. Well, okay, if you were to describe the Republican Party as you see it today, yeah. how would you describe it? Uh, I would describe it as isolationist, protectionist, and to a certain extent, nativist. That message couldn't be more clear if he screamed Trump's name. And so with Bush 43 reemerging out of the woodwork, obviously encouraging a return of the old gang of conventional Republicans to power, the schism between Trumpists and Bushies is real and growing. The never Trumpers who haunted Trump throughout his unique presidency were largely the remnant of the Bush 43 era longing for days gone by and another president wedded to traditional GOP politics and the neoconservative worldview established by the Bush wing of the GOP. That was, until Trump came along, most all of the Republican Party. But Trump stormed the gates of D.C., as the old saying goes, not to comfort the afflicted so much as to afflict the comfortable, including, but hardly limited to, GOP establishment operatives settled into a cushy and permanent beltway existence. 
fixtures of the conservative establishment from George Will to Bill Crystal and well beyond became apoplectic that Trump first proposed and then was able to achieve exactly what they had only pontificated and dreamed about for years. And so they went after the bombastic billionaire with everything they had. And in the process, they served as useful pawns or idiots for the Democratic Party. Never Trumpism was an internal oppositional movement against a president who had shaken Washington insiders from their pedestals by design. But what we have now is far more dangerous to the future of the conservative movement an open battle for the heart of the GOP between two dispossessed forces, each seen as disgraced and held in contempt by the other side. And both camps are sensing the peril and opportunity of the here and now, realizing that time is slipping away to establish a firm foothold in the party hierarchy and command the debate over the coming months and years. It seemed far-fetched to envision George W. Bush out of the shadows of a presidency which ended in a rock-bottom level of approval, emerging at this time after years of silence to add fuel to a burning fire. Perhaps he's beckoning revisionist historians to take a fresh look at his presidency, which he must believe won't look so bad in their eyes after they were forced to endure Donald Trump. Or perhaps he somehow believes he can serve as a linchpin for bringing the party back to what he believes is its senses. There will be a stark contrast between the agendas and utterances of those who were all in for Trump over these last four years and those seeking a return to the days when the GOP was, as the careerists see it, Not isolationist, but globalist, not protectionist, but free trading, and not nativist, but internationalist. There will be name-calling recriminations and a battle for the veritable soul of the party. Trumpists may not win that battle, but not for lack of grassroots support. Bushies may figure a way to carry the day by replacing the public's unpleasant memories of the Bush years with Vietnam-style flashbacks of January 6th. However, the swampists carry a heavy burden, a worldview which all but destroyed the Bush presidency and was central to the failed campaigns of John McCain and Mitt Romney. Indeed, with passion still high for Trump the president, if not Trump the man, a mere tactical triumph by the residual forces of George W. Bush in the entrenched establishment would lead to a party-wide conflagration. Such a pitched battle between old-time conservatives and populist nationalists would create irreparable harm and undoubtedly be too great for the party to bear if it hopes to remain competitive. In the end, a purge of the Trump era by swamp dwellers would amount to little more than a pyrrhic victory at the cost of the very future of the Republican Party. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel because truth, 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 truth is making a comeback. Far more important than my political future and far more important than yours the well-being of our country. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. And so the nation takes a long, deep breath with the verdict, or more precisely, a triple guilty verdict 
for former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin now in the books. But the larger issue of racial justice in an increasingly race conscious nation is left in its wake. We heard the calls earlier for this to be just the beginning of an aggressive agenda on racial justice in the offing on the left. So where do we go from here in a nation teetering dangerously on the edge of politically induced racial warfare? We turn once again to Jeff Charles of LibertyNation.com, who has written a thought-provoking piece entitled, Did So-Called Progressives Truly Want Chauvin Convicted? Welcome back, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Now, the title of your article sounds sort of like George W. Bush calling today's Republican Party isolationist, protectionist, and nativist, i.e. fighting words. Why exactly would progressives not want Derek Chauvin convicted? Well, you can kind of see it in the reaction, right? I mean, a lot of the a lot of hard leftist leaders, not all of them, but a lot of them are we're, we're looking forward to using this, right? And you can tell by how they reacted when he got convicted. They're saying things like they're saying things like, "Oh, this doesn't mean that we should stop or or police brutality is still an issue or don't th- th- this doesn't mean that the justice system is working perfectly and and nobody's actually making that argument they're arguing against an argument that doesn't exist so they're they're scrambling to try to still make some hay of this to try to exploit it whereas a not guilty verdict on all counts would have been a gift to them they could have exploited this much easier now jeff following the floyd killing we saw this nation set ablaze by progressive radicals marxists anarchists all manner of insurrectionists, but they had no excuse this time because of the three guilty verdicts. But these radicals will hardly go away, as you said. How do you expect them to next manifest their hatred for what they believe is a white supremacist hellhole? Yeah, so I mean, um, the Antifa movement, they're still going to be tearing up Portland, as always, they're, they're going to do it anyway, because they don't actually care about this stuff. They just want to be thugs. They just want to, to wreck stuff. Um, the, what they're going to do is they're going to wait for the next controversial police shooting. That's all it is. They're, they're just going to wait for the next excuse. Or if a conservative, or if conservatives have an event somewhere, they'll show up there. They'll, they'll still the, they'll still do the things that they normally do, but they are going to wait for the next controversial police shooting. Which it, that's just a matter of the media choosing to highlight one, which we, they already kind of did. And this one wasn't the the shooting in Ohio wasn't as controversial because of what what, what people saw in the body cam footage. But they'll they'll wait for the next time an officer oversteps or bounds or at least appears to, and then they'll blow that up, and then we'll have riots again. So Jeff, with all of the provocations and posturing of politicians from Maxine Waters to Kamala Harris. Who did you find, who could you find as a constructive voice as the nation was forced to revisit last summer's nightmare with this trial? You know, I looked and unfortunately, I I didn't really find many. I mean, I thought that what George Floyd's nephew said was was fitting. I mean, he talked about how this is a step in the right direction. He talked about this, about getting justice in this case. And he didn't really go into a lot of the race stuff. I mean, he talked about how this has impacted the black community over history and, and still does, but he didn't engage in a lot of the race baiting that you see on, on the far left. So I, that was the closest thing to somebody being productive. Now with the rank and file, I think that most people on the right and the left at thought that Chauvin should be punished for something. They may disagree as to which charges were appropriate and which ones weren't, but for the most part, people didn't believe that that Chauvin's actions were justifiable. All right, Jeff, so let's talk about next steps. What do you see as the next tangible step in the racial justice agenda of the left? So, I mean, the George Floyd, the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act is coming up and they're really pushing hard for that, especially after this verdict. And um, I'm not sure if it'll pass, but I, I really do. I really do think that that's going to be their next push. I'm not sure if I believe that they're sincere about it yet, because Democrats usually aren't. They, these are the, these are things that they usually say to pay lip service while not actually solving the problem. But I think that's what they're going to do. Leftists are going to leftists. I mean, they're going to they're going to continue race baiting. They're going to continue not looking for solutions. They're going to continue putting on political theater to make it look as if they're trying to to get solutions. Meanwhile, you'll have the people on the ground who actually want solutions 
get passed over. They're not going to get a lot of the attention. Uh, Black Lives Matter is still going to exploit their dead children to get millions and millions of donations from white progressives who mean well and think that they're actually helping black people, but they're really not. So I don't, uh, there is an opportunity for change here. I just don't think that the left wants to do it. And honestly, frankly, I don't think that the right does either. So you've sort of answered the question already, but what, if anything, do you expect to hear from the right or action that might come from the right on the issue of race in the wake of this trial and verdict? Yeah, um, unfortunately, I'm already seeing that they're not handling this very well. And again, I'm not talking about the rank and file, because like I said, from what I've seen, most rank and, rank and file conservatives believe that Chauvin could have should have been convicted of something. But our influencers, and I won't name names, but a lot of our influencers are trying to discredit the trial, and they were already trying to discredit the trial even before it was over, even weeks ago. They were trying to say that it wasn't going to be fair. They are already priming us for that narrative. This would be an opportunity for people who claim that they that they value the, the the notion of limited government to start making some inroads and start saying, you know what, the government shouldn't be able to overstep their bounds and not be held accountable. Unfortunately, we're still making our, our influencers and our politicians are still making the same mistakes that they've made in the past. But hopefully, I mean, we, we <laughs> I hate to say it, but we've still got the Ahmaud Arbery trial coming up with, with the Mike McMichaels. Maybe we have a chance to do the right thing there. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, as always. Thank you for having me. Jeff Charles, LibertyNation.com. Quick break, and then we're back with Talking Liberty. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. And now it is time for the portion of Liberty Nation Radio, which we entitled Talking Liberty. As we reintroduce our regular contributor, constitutional lawyer, LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor, and wait for it, our guardian of individual liberty, Scott David Cosenza. Hello, Scott. Hi, Tim. Well, you followed the trial of Derek Chauvin as closely as anybody wrote about it, talked about it. So I have a number of peripheral questions about this trial Uh, with so much on the line. So, Scott, here's my first question. How can a man be guilty of three kinds of murder or manslaughter all at the same time? Uh, Yeah, that's a sticky wicket for sure, right? Uh, It's somewhat confusing because uh, for some of the charges, uh, an intent or purposefulness is required, and then for others, negligence is required, which is the opposite of that. they are uh, cognitively dissonant verdicts, I would say, but yet it's they're also legal, Tim. Uh, you have to recall that the third degree murder charge as applied to Derek Chauvin is a novel thing in the law. Um, I did write about that issue, particularly on the pages of LibertyNation.com. So for people to kind of unpack that it, it, at a more lengthy pace, but typically third degree murder is not used against somebody who acts against an individual. It's used against somebody who acts with extreme negligence towards a large group of people. For instance, if somebody drunk drives, drink, goes drinking and driving, uh, they don't necessarily have regard for anybody on the road, but they don't intend violence against any particular person. So I, I It's that part is weird. And for the second degree, um, normally you wouldn't necessarily charge the uh, manslaughter because it's a lesser included offense. And it would be just part of the lesser included offenses given uh, at the time the jury was going to deliberate. But this is. You know, you, you've heard, of course, the term throw the book at him, Tim. They, they did throw the book at him. And, and that's what we have here now. Um, he won't be sentenced on all those separate counts, though, just to be clear, just on the most serious of the charges per Minnesota law, um, the second degree or felony murder charge that he was convicted of. He'll be sentenced on that charge uh, alone. Any guess as to the length of sentence? Well, the guidelines suggest it should be like in the little in the low teens. Uh, but the prosecution is acting asking for a departure from the guidelines. So this is kind of a thing we have to kind of unpack a little bit. The The statute says that somebody who's convicted of first uh, of second degree murder can, ha- can be sentenced up to 40 years in, in, in prison. But then there are something called guidelines. OK, now the guidelines have nothing to do with the law. They're, they're guidelines, as they as they suggest. But the, the courts have said that if you depart from the guidelines, you have to kind of undertake a special 
like mini hearing to determine whether or not there were certain uh, basically aggravating factors that allow you to depart from the guidelines. Uh, Chauvin has already said that the, he waives his right to a jury to determine those factors and will let uh, Judge Cahill, the trial judge, uh, rule on whether or not those factors are present, which would then allow him, the judge, who is going to issue this sentence to deviate upwards, which is what the prosecution is asking for. So because it was a cop, because he did it in front of a child, for instance, committed this crime, uh, they're asking for a deviation upward from those charges. Um, you know, guessing about whether that's actually going to happen or not, it, it is a guess. I think um, – well, I, you know, why, why, it's like it's pure speculation, Tim, but that's what the prosecution is going for. They're going for that enhanced thing. I would say uh, I would be surprised if it was more than more than teens in terms of the number of years that Derek Chauvin was sentenced to. And then he doesn't actually have to do all that time. Uh, as you you know, we, we hear these stories about you know people getting out of prison early and not doing their full time. That's also going to be true for Mr. Chauvin, uh, provided he does you know uh, a good job of being a prisoner and doesn't you know uh, recommit any crimes in prison. He'll probably get out in a decade. Now, as we discussed this case over these last weeks, Scott, you seemed to think that the defense had been making an increasingly persuasive case for Chauvin's acquittal. What happened? Well, I don't I wouldn't couch it that way, Tim. I would say that I thought that the I thought increasingly that the state wasn't meeting its burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is the way uh, at the risk of sounding pedantic for, you know, the, the, the standard that they must meet. I do take it like Chauvin entered the courthouse as an innocent man and the state had the, the burden to prove him beyond a reasonable doubt of all these charges. And, for instance, the most serious charge. Uh, of felony murder. I, I just don't understand how, um, uh, well, I should say I just don't understand. I don't think they met their burden by by proving that beyond a reasonable doubt. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that an appeals court would seem uh, to agree with that. Uh, I think that it would be easy to make the case for uh, manslaughter and the third degree issues we've already discussed. I think those are kind of, uh, that shouldn't even be on the plate here. So really what I think should be on the plate is, is, uh, the, the, the appropriate charge is manslaughter, I think, not not murder, uh, felony murder or murder in the second degree. And I did think that the state failed to meet that burden. It's their burden to meet. So uh, the defense, you know, can help poke holes. But if, if the state doesn't meet its burden in their case in chief, which is where I thought we were, Tim, on that murder charge. Um, and what happened was the jury disagreed with me. You know, we'll we'll, ha we'll have to wait and see. Uh, hopefully we'll get some interviews um, from that jury pool, and uh, we'll learn what their thinking was. So, Scott, does the Maxine Waters statement and her subsequent admonishment by Judge Peter Cahill provide legitimate grounds for appeal? Well, certainly there is a chance that it could be overturned on appeal. But I mean, any, not, any serious chance. Yeah, it's not a moonshot, okay? It, it's it's far above zero, um, but it's it's also far below, you know, a very high percentage. You know, it's not like a great bet. I wouldn't take that bet with money that meant a lot to me. Uh, but I also wouldn't bet uh, on the other outcome uh, without great odds in my favor. I, this is there are many issues that happen during this trial that present uh, grounds for an appeal. And it's not an outside shot uh, that he would get it granted. Tim, you know, we talk about uh, the, the issue of the fair trial and whether the jurors were free to give a, a verdict uh, of not guilty, for instance. And Hennepin County Courthouse was like the green zone in Iraq, according to ABC's legal <laughs> political right. reporter, right. hardly a bastion of conservative news. So when I read that, you know, I thought, gee, wh where should juries be sequestered if not for uh, in this case, you know, uh, what what kind of publicity would warrant it, if not this or or have the trial moved, which they probably should have done both. Um, but of course, uh, they didn't. So Mr. Chauvin will have his appeal. And uh, I'm sure both of those points will be pressed on appeal. Do we have a sense of whether this jury was it all poisoned or intimidated by the threats of public officials and racial justice warriors? Well, they were bound, I think, by oath to report any kind of direct you know, threat or something like that. But we don't know, Tim. You know, you could just imagine um, somebody's spouse knows they're on a jury pool. And as they leave for 
uh, verdict day, they make sure that the spouse knows that, you know, they don't want the house burned down uh, that week. You know, it could just be a side uh, sideways glance uh, with this kind of pressure. Juries, Tim, are not supposed to have a, uh, a vested interest in the outcome of a trial. That's one of the reasons why it does make sense to move a trial like this away from, you know, that hot that hotbed locale, because if you're worried about your house getting vandalized or worse, or if you're worried about your wife's work firing her because they find out you were a jury and voted the wrong way, uh, then Derek Chauvin didn't get a free trial. That's why it would have made sense uh, for Judge Cahill to move the case uh, to some other jurisdiction. Scott, you know, as a civilian observer of these trials and an interested one, it seemed to me a slam dunk that the jury would be sequestered for this trial, but the judge decided differently. In your opinion, should the jury have been sequestered? Tim, you're practically a scratch golfer in the armchair legal analyst uh, position. I always appreciate that. Thank you. Coming from you, that means (laughs) a lot. Um, Yes, especially, Tim, I think, after the civil settlement was announced. Uh, You know, with perfect hindsight, I think perhaps since the outset of the jury being seated, they should have been sequestered. But certainly after that, if there was any indication that this, you know, or or when uh, that uh, that young man got shot in Brooklyn Center, it it just seems like absolutely. Yes, Um, I really do think after the civil settlement, uh, the idea that this was somehow going to go away or that people were going to be able to consume media at all. Um, and not have it infect them is is gone. Judge Cahill uh, ordered the jury not to consume news. Basically, don't watch the news is what he said, right? But if you're on Facebook, which he didn't he didn't forbid, or other social media, how can you get away from it? It's impossible. Yeah. I mean, and he said he instructed the jury not to turn on the news, but that's not a very good protection no. against having the jury spoiled by public information. So, I'm Scott, sure that, I'm sure that uh, Chauvin is going to be making that. Uh, that uh, argument before the uh, before the appeals courts very soon, Tim. So, Scott, in summary, what happened in this trial that you wouldn't have expected and what went pretty much according to the form you did expect? Well, the defense expert witness whose um, name, I'm sorry, is escaping me at the moment, was a horror show for the defense. Um, this use of force expert uh, was just turned around and tongue tied. Uh, by the prosecution, they made mincemeat out of him. Uh, that was a surprise that they didn't have better, uh, you know, a better witness in that regard. Uh, also, on the prosecution side, I thought it was surprising how much the judge allowed in that I thought was um, basically just piling on. You know, you can't have if there if there's a murder in the middle of a football game at a stadium with a hundred thousand people, and you can't have a hundred thousand people come in and say that what they thought they saw because it's just piling on. And, and there was some of that in in the jury uh, in the trial that was not probative. Uh, that, by the way, another potential grounds uh, for an appeal. Um, and for the rest of it, you know, Tim, I, I, I did watch almost all this this uh, trial, and I don't get a chance to watch. Uh, murder trials uh, to verdict uh, very often. So uh, the whole thing was uh, an interesting education. Uh, any any uh, foreign state, which is to say that I'm not licensed to practice law uh, in Minnesota. So looking at how they do things a little bit differently there uh, was also interesting. Before they sent the jury uh, to uh, deliberate, Tim, they actually swore in uh, the bailiff to make sure that he would not allow any uh, information to enter the jury room that didn't come from the court. That was something new. I have not seen that. I've seen juries be charged before in other states, and, and I have not seen that procedure. So little things like that, you know, for the nerd legal mind, it's uh, that, that, that's what that's what interests me. That's what we pay you for, Scott. <laughs> yeah, Thanks right. for joining us. You're welcome. Scott Cosenza. Legal Affairs Editor at LibertyNation.com. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcasts, The Uprising, hosted by Scott, and The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, all available on demand at LibertyNation.com and from fine podcast providers everywhere. So that is it for this week, but we will be back at you next week. Same time, same station. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying stand up for liberty. And we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio.